Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for participating in today's webinar, Relationship Goals, Utility and Industry Partnership on CHP, Incentives and Opportunities in AEP and DPNL Territories. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be made available to all webinar participants. I'm Miranda Lepla, the Clean Energy Attorney at the Ohio Environmental Council. I'll be moderating our webinar this morning. In 2012, Ohio Senate Bill 315 was enacted, adding combined heat and power as a qualifying energy efficiency measure, thereby allowing electric distribution utilities to offer financial incentives to customers who installed a CHP system. With the end of the two-year freeze in Ohio's efficiency standard late last year, Ohio's energy efficiency resource and renewable portfolio standards are back in force. Happily, the two utilities featured today on our webinar never stopped offering incentives for CHP technologies during the freeze, and all utilities filed new efficiency plans in 2016 with better incentives for CHP technology than ever before. Despite the enactment of this policy five years ago, only a handful of projects have received incentives from the utilities to develop projects. However, with new technology and partnerships with utilities, we expect to see expansion of the use of CHP systems across the state. This webinar will address specific incentives available in AEP Ohio and DPNL territories, followed by discussion of the benefits of CHP to customers and overcoming barriers customers face with implementing CHP. Our speakers today are first Michelle Cross, who manages AEP Ohio's Combined Heat and Power Program, Continuous Energy Improvement Program, and the Data Center Program for business customers. Next, we will hear from Lyle Garrison, Program Manager for the Efficiency, Energy Efficiency Group at Dayton Power and Light. And finally, we'll hear from John Syriac, Founder and CEO of Go Sustainable Energy and a professional engineer. Our first speaker, Michelle Cross, will be discussing AEP Ohio's CHP incentive structure and additional opportunities customers have to determine what type of CHP system works for their business. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Miranda. I'm just going to wait a minute and see if um, I can change the slide here. Okay, there we go. Uh, sorry, I hit the button a couple of times. Now it's catching up. Okay, so as Miranda had mentioned, AEP Ohio is offering a combined heat and power program as part of our suite of energy efficiency incentive programs. <laughs> so the opportunity for utilities to count and incentivize combined heat and power projects has been established by recent Ohio legislation. CHP has been defined in eligibility criteria established by a Senate Bill 310. And what I have here on the slide is <clears throat> direct language from Senate Bill 310 that defines combined heat and power as the co-production of electricity and useful thermal energy from the same fuel source. In addition, it states that CHP systems for incentive purposes must be designed to achieve overall efficiency levels of at least 60% and 20% of the system's total useful energy in the form of thermal energy. So those are two pretty distinct eligibility criteria that we are working off of through this program. And I'll be talking about a little bit more as, as we go through the rest of the presentation. OK. Um, having a little bit of a delay on the changing of slides. OK, there we go. So uh, we see customers installing CHP systems to help reduce energy costs by offsetting electricity with other fuel purchases. CHP systems shift electric load away from a centralized power plant to a more efficient CHP unit, which is typically located near the point of use. So 
Everything in this picture that is outside of the rectangle dotted lines here is more of a traditional approach that does not include CHP. So as the picture shows, electricity is provided by a power plant um, and is uh, transferred to the grid and ultimately to the end user. And through this process, we tend to see transmission and distribution line losses. Separately, an end user may have a boiler on site for process heating. Um, it provides heat loads for even potentially hot water heating. And so they're using purchased fuel to run the boiler as well. Under a CHP system, these two pieces are combined. And uh, this is going to be everything in the picture within the dashed line. And what you see in a CHP system is a prime mover um, powers a prime mover is powered by um, purchased fuel, and this is in the top right-hand corner, and this is the equipment shown in yellow. And this prime mover can be a gas turbine, reciprocating engine, a microturbine. And in this scenario, it's the CHP system, this prime mover that is generating the electricity, which would otherwise need to be generated and transferred from the power plant and electric utility. In addition, with the CHP system, you also have uh, thermal heat that is being generated. And this thermal heat can be used through other um, parts of the processes uh, through process heat, again, like I said, hot water heating, or even an absorption chiller. So it's important to note that although the CHP system may increase the amount of fuel that is used on site because of the additional fuel required to operate the prime mover. Uh, even though this is the case, there are still potentially energy savings to be had by reducing demand and electric load. And so you can reduce overall energy costs with the CHP system. So AEP Ohio is offering cash incentives to customers with eligible CHP projects. So um, the program is targeting industrial and institutional facilities. However, any business customer may participate if they meet the eligibility requirements in regards to efficiency. So that's the 60% overall, 20% thermal efficiency. And the minimum design generation for our program is 500,000 kWh per year and a minimum design of 8,000 run hours per year. And I want to mention that um, the key words here are design. So we understand that customers may have some initial problems through startup or commissioning of the equipment. And we're willing to work through customers as they commission the equipment. But we want to make sure that their system is being designed to operate uh, at least 8,000 hours per year. So the incentive rates that AEP Ohio is offering is for systems less than or equal to 1,000 kW. We're offering an incentive rate of $0.05 cents per net kWh generated. And um, I want to talk about this word net for a second. And net means recover kWh. And so what we need to do is take into account parasitic losses of the system. So that would be any type of power that the system is then using to power itself. We need to take those into account that's not really usable or recovered KWH. We can uh, pay this payment over a period of one to five years. However, for the smaller projects, we are preferring to pay them within one year. Um, we we want to pay them as quickly as possible. We do have limited funding, and our budgets are quite tight. So um, that may be a driving factor with how long it might take us to, um, to pay out the total incentive. So we want to make sure that the incentive payments fit our limited budget and the number of current participants. Moving down for systems greater than 1,000 kW, the incentive rate is 3.5 cents per recovered kWh. 
And I want to note that the higher incentive on the smaller units is due to the fact that research, research shows um, that smaller units are almost twice more expensive per KW. So we're finding that customers are having a hard time getting these projects approved. So we do want to we do want to be able to drive some of the smaller projects as well, and we think that the higher incentive rate can help do that. Um, again, the payment period is one to five years, and it's going to be for these larger projects and in the largest of other participants that are most likely to be paid over multiple years. In addition with these incentive rates, we do have a cap of $500,000 per project per year. So one thing to note here is the cap would most likely hit for those larger projects, and splitting the payment out over multiple years may be a benefit to the customer in the sense that their incentive may not be capped. So what are the steps for customers that want to participate? First, they would contact AP Ohio, and we would jointly complete and sign an application and commitment agreement with the customer. And these applications require quite a bit of system detailing, including flow diagrams, electrical drawings, and efficiency calculations. So this step may take uh, quite a bit of time, but AEP Ohio is working closely with the customer to, to try to put all the pieces together and, and get the paperwork wrapped up. Once all the documents are compiled and signed by both parties, the application may need to be filed and approved with the Public Utilities Commission. So if the project and all payments are completed by December 31st of 2020, then the project will not need to be filed with the PUC. If the payments extend beyond 2020, which is our approved plan period, then the application will need to be filed for approval. So that could be an additional step and um, a little bit of a waiting period for that approval process to take place. Once the project is approved and the system is commissioned, typical payments will begin 12 months after reader meetings to verify KWH recovered. <coughs> uh, advanced partial payments may be considered before the full 12 months of meter readings are available. Um, Again, we're going to work with the customer to determine what's the best strategy for the incentive payment. Um, so in addition to um, or, or how we come up with the net KWH generated, how that's determined is we do require that an electric meter be installed at the output of the system. And this meter is required to meet the ANSI C12.20 standards and have an accuracy of plus or minus half a percent. And this is, a, this is a standard electric meter for electric utilities. So if anyone is looking for what type of meters meet these standards, we can give you a list of, um, there's quite a few out there on the market that meet these standards. As I mentioned, um, parasitic losses will be removed from the gross KWH generated. And these parasitic losses may be calculated by the customer based on placement of other meters. However, if the losses cannot be calculated, then we'll use the DOE estimated losses, which is in the range of 3 to 6%, depending on the technology that is being used in the CHP system. So as an example, a gas turbine would be at the 6% range. Um, something smaller, like a microturbine, would be closer to 3%. Uh, monthly readings are required to be reported to AEP Ohio, and then an annual affidavit uh, will need to be submitted before payment can be made. And we'll give you a copy of the annual affidavit. It just uh, requires that you identify the annual KWH that you generated and you sign and it needs to be notarized. Sorry for the delay, the slide is not moving.
I can go ahead and continue. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <clears throat> So we do encourage customers who are thinking about installing CHP and investigating a CHP system at their facility to visit AEP Ohio's website for more information on project screenings. And what we have on our website is a high-level checklist that helps a customer determine if you, if you may even really have a viable project. In addition, we have links to free screenings, um, one through OMA and uh, for manufacturers and one through DOE. And so we definitely encourage customers to take advantage of those. What we find is that um, CHP system performance is inherently tied to customer operations and business practices. So it may not pose the same benefits for all customers. And we want to make sure that customers are making the right decision uh, for what is the best equipment to install at their facility. So for an example, a business that operates only eight hours a day, five days a week, and has low thermal energy demand may not have the potential for energy savings with the CHP system that a business that operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and high thermal energy demands would have. So we, we're willing to work with the customer and make sure that your CHP project is the right fit. Um, and we encourage you to use the screenings that are available on our website. In addition, we encourage customers to complete a feasibility study, which can provide a more in-depth analysis of a CHP project cost and its impacts. And so I have on here um, a link to our website. But if you go to aepohio.com slash solutions, you can drill down and get to our CHP landing page. Okay, this is the last slide anyways, and this is just my contact information. So for any AEP Ohio customers that are considering CHP, um, here's my number, my email address, please give me a call, reach out to me, and we can start working with you and um, see if it's, if it's a project that, would even, um, that you would even want to move forward with. Um, anybody else on the call that has any questions about our programs, again, please feel free to reach out to me. So that was all I had, and I'll just open it up and see if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, we did have a few questions come in while you were speaking, and you answered quite a few of them, actually, throughout the presentation. Um, but one question that came in was whether or not AEP is going to be doing some outreach to customers in their uh, territory. Yes, definitely. And this you know, webinar is just the first step in that, but we're definitely going to be presenting the CHP program during customer education seminars, which are upcoming. And in addition, um, we're using our other programs and outreach personnel to help um, get the word out about this new program. We also are working on putting a flyer together, and we'll continue to update our website as more information becomes available. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, if anyone has additional questions, we will be taking questions at the end of this as well. And if there's anything specific, you have Michelle's contact information also. Um, thank you again, Michelle. And with that, we will next hear from Lyle Garrison, who's the program manager for the Energy Efficiency Group at Dayton Power and Light. In that light, Lyle is going to discuss the incentives and policies available to customers in DPNL's territory. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Michelle and Miranda. Um, I'll go ahead and get started here. I believe I have control of the slides now. Okay. So I, I just wanted to start off uh, by updating, um, updating you guys on the energy efficiency legislation in Ohio and, and where DPNL stands. Um, within that. So uh, 2017 is the ninth year the DPNL has been uh, running the energy efficiency programs. Um, 
So we, in Senate Bill 310, so we discussed earlier, there was a two-year freeze on uh, efficiency mandates. Um, well, utilities were given a couple different options. Uh, they could do nothing and just suspend programs. Uh, they could file a new plan, or they could continue their current program plan. Ours was from 2013 to 2015. We decided to uh, continue that portfolio plan through 2016. That remained unchanged. Um, this past uh, summer, we filed a new three-year plan um, that would uh, encompass 2017, 18, and 19. Um, shortly after we filed that, the Utility Commission um, asked uh, all the utilities in Ohio to uh, consider extending the, uh, the current plan an additional year. Uh, so that's what we decided to do. Uh, we continued our 2016 plan unchanged into 2017. So we did uh, file a stipulation for that plan um, in December, and, uh, and that allowed us to continue programs into 2017. So uh, this summer, we plan on filing another three-year plan. Uh, hopefully, that will go through this time around. I believe AEP uh, had just gotten a uh, four-year plan approved, so it looks good for, for the other utilities um, for the 2018, 2019, 2020 program years. So um, because we extended our uh, portfolio plan, really, this will be the third year fourth year that it has remained unchanged. Uh, we're starting to run into uh, slide kind of change. Starting to run into uh, some some budget constraints. So as uh, as our goals stay the same, we are continuing to claim more and more savings and uh, achieve uh, and, and and spend more money on rebates. So as you can see, our goal our uh, goal has been pretty flat. Uh, from 2014, 15, 16, and 17, and our savings have been increasing um, exponentially here. So uh, we do have, and I'll talk about this here in a minute, we do have some budget constraints and some caps and limits to us, our CHP program. Okay, uh, most of our savings uh, does come from lighting. Uh, that's probably pretty common with most utilities. But um, CHP would fit under the other category for us here. So, and uh, with a few CHP projects, that could increase that piece of the pie uh, pretty significantly. So, uh, the programs we do offer currently, uh, our business programs, they're split up into two uh, main programs: our prescriptive rebates and our custom rebates. Uh, prescriptive is pretty much one for one swap outs, really easy stuff. You don't have to have pre-approval for any of these. And then we have our custom programs, which uh, you do require pre-approval. Um, these are a little bit more complex. Uh, we have to do some engineering, some metering, things like that. And that's where CHP falls. So um, back in May of 2015, uh, we developed a CHP incentive structure. Uh, that kind of coincided with a workshop that uh, we hosted in partnership with uh, the Ohio Environmental Council, and OMA. So um, when we developed that, uh, it's actually a pretty lucrative um, incentive structure. But it is, it is designed for smaller systems. So um, the incentive structure we have right now is $0.08 cents per uh, kilowatt hour generated. And that will be paid out at six months after commissioning and 12 months after uh, commissioning. And that will be. Uh, That'll be based on the, the metered output. Um, we will also pay $100 per kW capacity of the system, and that will be paid at project completion. So some of the uh, limits here uh, that I mentioned uh, is we will limit it to 50% of project costs. Uh, and like AEP, we have a $500,000 per account uh, cap. And, um, the incentive has to be paid directly to the customer. Uh, we, we won't split it up uh, and assign portions of it to the vendor. And really, it's designed for projects that are, uh, that are around um, 
500 kilowatt uh, or less. So any project, any project that would be uh, bigger than that, we would look at on a case by case basis. But we would definitely be uh, still interested in in sending that and being a partner through the entire process. So like I said, it would be applied for uh, through our custom program. Um, Pre-approval would be required, and it must be obviously installed in the EPNL territory. And like uh, AEP, uh, we do uh, require a minimum efficiency on these systems, and that is 60% uh, based on uh, lower heating value. And then that is our incentive is tiered up from there. So if you install a system that is between 60 and 70%, you'll get 80% of the calculated uh, rebate. If you install a system that's 70 to 80 percent, you will get 90 90 percent of the rebate. And then if you install a system that's 80 percent or more efficient, uh, you will get the full eight cents and a hundred dollars. Okay. So as we mentioned earlier, um, we do have limits and there's a reason we have limits. Um, per Senate Bill 310 and 315, if you actually read that, uh, the utilities are limited on the amount of um, KWH they can claim uh, for combined heat and power systems. So the way that it's broken down, it's kind of hard to understand um, until you do the math. Uh, utilities are allowed to claim uh, the, the percentage of industrial customers as it pertains to their annual energy efficiency requirements. So our industrial load is made up of about, about 25 percent um, and then our annual savings goal is uh, one percent of our total load so essentially if you do the math and break that down and follow this, uh, this process flow we can claim about four megawatts worth of combined heat and power annually so that's why we put limits on here now we can we can uh, we can still rebate and incent projects up and above that, but that will require us to do a separate filing with the Public Utility Commission of Ohio, and we're we're totally still open to do that, and actually uh, would love to see a project on that size or bigger. Okay. Just go to the next slide here. Okay, like AEP, we do um, we do encourage customers to uh, do a feasibility study first, uh, just to to make sure the uh, the project makes sense financially, um, and we will uh, provide up to ten thousand dollars to subsidize a feasibility study. Uh, the way that will work is uh, is EPNL will reimburse fifty percent upfront uh, once the study is complete, and then. Um, uh, if a customer uh, decides to go through with a CHP project and that is implemented, the customer will get the, uh, the second 50% after that project is commissioned. Okay? So, and I know uh, Michelle also mentioned uh, high-level preliminary um, analysis and some studies, and uh, I know OMA offers that. I'm sure John will talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to talk about DOE's program a little bit as well. Um, Cliff Hackey is the contact over there for the uh, Midwest CHP Technical Assistance Program, part of partnership. Um, and they will do a, a couple of different things for you there. They will do a, a preliminary screening. Um, they will take a look at your feasibility study for you once that is complete and make sure everything makes sense. Um, and they can do an investment grade analysis of any kind of third-party engineering that's done, and now they can also um, review specs and bids and help you in that process as well. So I would encourage you to take down this information, and uh, and if you are interested, get in contact um, with Cliff for a high-level look at CHP, or you can contact DPNL and us, and we can get you in touch. We would love to be partners uh, with everybody involved through this entire process. Okay, so as far as submitting an application uh, for combined heat and power, it is all done online. 
uh, we do have an application uh, page just for combined heat power, um, and that is dpnl.com slash CHP. Um, so uh, there are a couple documents that you need, mostly an application. It's a five-page application. It's nothing too strenuous, um, but we would encourage you to do a feasibility study before you were to complete an application. Okay. Also, uh, concerns uh, a lot of people have with CHP is that you do have to go through the interconnection process because you are generating your own power on your site. So uh, BPNL does have an, uh, a process that we follow. We do have to do an engineering review uh, of safety and reliability, and there are some technical requirements. Um, we do actually do this pretty quickly, and there is a, a very small fee um, for your interconnection, I believe. For anything that's under 50 kW, um, it only usually takes about half an hour to an hour, and that's in the, at a rate of $66 an hour. It's very cheap. Anything between 50 kilowatts and 2 megawatts, it's a $50 application fee and then $1 per kilowatt. And then anything over 2 megawatts, it'll be a $50 application fee and two dollars per kilowatt so it's, it's nothing nothing that will will stop you from doing a CHP project um, so there is a couple steps that you'll follow an application process we do have to sign a formal uh, interconnection agreement and um, we will have to have some metering installed um, now another uh, possibility is to get credit for net metering so net metering, uh, when it pertains to CHP, would be uh, applicable uh, for micro turbine driven system, where we will actually pay you for anything that you put back on the grid. So I believe that's, uh, that's my last slide. Do we have any uh, DPNL specific uh, questions uh, at this point? Lyle, we did have one question about um, whether any projects have been installed in DPNL territory under the incentive program and how many kilowatts, if so. Currently, we haven't had any installations in our territory. Um, we, would we would love to see one. We've had a few customers um, look, do feasibility studies and um, move pretty far along in the process, but those have been smaller micro turbine systems. Um, nothing bigger than you know 300 kW. Okay, well I think that was the only specific one we had at this point, so we will keep moving. Um, and next up we have John Syriac, who is the founder and CEO of Go Sustainable Energy and an energy consultant to the Ohio Manufacturers Association. John is going to discuss the benefits of CHP to customers, the barriers customers face with implementing CHP, and how you can overcome those barriers. Good morning, everyone. Okay, just waiting for control here. I can put my presentation up. Oh, okay, we're cycling through. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm John Syriac with Go Sustainable Energy. Um, uh, on behalf of the Ohio Manufacturers Association, we are an energy efficiency consulting firm. So um, one thing I wanted to let you know is uh, what we do, um, we provide unbiased, accurate information on energy efficiency and other customer-sided energy resources to our customers, which are industrial, commercial, um, utility sector, um, we don't sell products, um, so we can't sell you a CHP system. Uh, we don't do design services, uh, financing, project management, um, any of those things. And, and the reason why is so that we're, um, uh, we are not part of the, the revenue stream from the recommendation per se. So we work as an owner's advocate in the best interest of our, our clients and our strengths are, are identifying energy savings opportunities quantifying the savings, um, 
and uh, that that's what we get hired for. So um, that role of our company has led us to have a, a good relationship with the Ohio Manufacturers Association, um, where essentially we we do a lot of the same things, just with a different scope. Um, instead of one-on-one, -on -one, um, we're working with a, a group of manufacturers and and providing timely advice when we can and when we can be helpful. The OMA's mission is to protect and grow Ohio manufacturing. Um, they have about 1,400 member plants in the state. They are the state's trade association for manufacturing, and they do a lot of work on energy. Um, and so sometimes that's policy and regulatory intervention, which is steered by the energy group. Um, there are quarterly information meetings, which are broader. Um, they have the what they call their energy committee meeting, which also has um, non-manufacturer affiliate members um, that come to those meetings. I believe some are on the on the call today. And then we have what we call the Energy Efficiency Peer Network. Um, this is a group of, of uh, what I would call the the implementers or practitioners within the, the manufacturing companies. Um, those that are charged with doing energy savings projects <clears throat> in the plant. Um, and uh, the intent of the peer network is to, um, to provide information and, and expertise and learning opportunities to see, uh, um, see what other manufacturers are doing and learn from that. So we'll do a couple technical webinars throughout the year. We also set up about three plant tours each year, and just last this month we were at the Solve A Specialty Chemicals Combined Heat and Plant uh, Combined Heat and Power Plant Tour. Um, we had you know close to 30 people come out um, and take a look at that pretty pretty recent seven megawatt project um, down at Solve A Specialty Chemicals in Marietta. Um, so that it's it can be extremely helpful to um, get out and see the um, the projects as they're done. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, CHP potential um, benefits, barriers, um, resources, and other considerations. And I um, uh, wanted to leave you with, at the start, um, the one, what I call the one thing of the presentation, um, or what I would speak, uh, what I want to impart to you today. And that's to take the right next step. Um, so see it, combined heat and power, you know, looking at this from a, a customer perspective, um, this is, I would never say combined heat and power is, a, um, is an easy decision or one that gets a green light right away. Um, they, these can be big involved projects that have a lot of costs and a lot of um, other things associated with the implications for any organization, manufacturing or otherwise. Um, and so um, for those on the phone who are, who are customers, manufacturers um, that are thinking, considering CHP, it's about taking the right next step, I think. Um, and for those that are work with customers, um, keep that in mind that also um, this isn't going to be something, these projects that we get, get an OK on right away. Um, OK. Moving on, so uh, we've heard about combined heat and power um, a bit, and my guess is most of the folks on the phone have a very, um, anywhere ranging from an intuitive sense to a very detailed understanding of combined heat and power. Um, I wanted to back out a little bit um, and go over it again, though, and, and part of this is because I ask, um, you know, in working on this, this topic, you know, the big question, so what? Right? Why, why do we care about this? Um, why do we have a lot of people on the call today? What's the big deal? Um, and I think it's, you know, right now it's, there's so much potential. So this graph, which I uh, uh, borrowed from the Midwest CHT, CHP Technical Assistance Partnership, um, uh, I think illustrates well um, what's, what we have with the electric grid today. We have lots of fuel um, resources coming into the electric grid to help power it. That's on the left-hand side. And then if you look at what comes out, what are we doing with all that energy um, that we're converting into electricity? And all the useful things are these, these smaller yellow arrows. Some of it goes to the residential sector, some commercial, some industrial, and whatnot. Um, but surprisingly, when you look at, the, look at it this way, the useful electricity, that looks pretty small. It looks pretty small compared to the amount of energy we put in. And the big arrow, are, the big red arrow is this are these conversion losses, which is essentially heat. 
Um, great, my animation is working. <laughs> so, like, what is that? You know, what are these losses? Where are we putting most of our energy that we're using for the electrical grid? And we're putting it right up the stack. That's what we're doing with it. Um, it goes off as, um, as waste heat from the electric generation process. And we see that when we drive by a traditional power plant, um, fossil fueled or, or nuclear, um, a lot of the, 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 what's coming out the stack isn't smoke. This is, um, this is steam. This is uh, cooling. It's heat um, that we're giving off. Um, so, you know, I think there is a gut, you know, a, a gut interest in CHP because people see all this waste tea and they say, well, um, maybe I can, maybe I can match make that. Um, because there's lots of facilities out there that make hot water, make steam. Um, they might use an absorption chiller to make chilled water. Um, so they're using heat to make chilled water. Um, but we pay for that. We meaning our businesses, our manufacturers, our hospitals, our universities. Um, we spend money and we, we use other resources to make heat. So can we match make up the, the waste heat from electricity generation to the useful heat um, that we're spending money on elsewhere. So that, that's the basic potential of CHP. Seems like, a, seems like a pretty good idea. Um, and, then, and then you start thinking of it in a micro sense to, um, or I guess macro sense, like what are there, this is a good idea, are there benefits? There sure are. Um, it's a very efficient use of resources. Um, we get lower overall emissions. Uh, it is a great um, way to use uh, what we now have, which is a local source of natural gas um, in the state and in our region. Distributed power can improve grid reliability and um, to rate payers to the system. This is a lower cost resource than traditional generation. So there's a lot of obvious benefits that come about once we start thinking of CHP. So then the next question is, is this a, it's a good idea. Is it a little deal or is it a big deal? Um, you know, is this a, a small interest or big interest? And so I've We've got a map here. Um, folks have looked at this, done studies on how much potential is there for combined heat and power in the country. And the dark green states, one of which is Ohio, have the most potential. So we see that there's, there's some pretty good potential. Ohio fits in as one of the, the leading states. So if you want to think in the terms of what resources does Ohio have um, on the energy spectrum, combined heat and power is one of our greatest resources. That is not to say we don't have combined heat and power already. We actually do. We've got about 50 total CHP sites in Ohio. You can find a list of them um, on the PUCO website. And uh, there's quite a bit of electric generation there, um, over 750 megawatts. And this is, I think, important to keep in mind when we talk about combined heat and power. Unlike fuel cells or batteries or wind turbines or, or solar power, this is, um, combined heat and power isn't um, coming off the research and development um, path and into com commercialization. It, it has been around for decades. Um, we're, we're talking about matching up high quality waste heat um, from electric generation with um, a need to generate hot water and steam. And you know, a fundamental piece of that is a heat exchanger. It's a, it's a piece of metal. Um, and so the, the basic technology for combined heat and power has been around for decades and in fact, um, there's quite a bit of it out there already. So it is a, it, it's not a, an unproven technology. It's a proven technology. There's a fair amount of it in the state. Um, 750 megawatts, that's a, that's a couple um, traditional power plant units. So had we not had this CHP um, for some time, uh, in place of it, we would have needed um, a couple utility-sized traditional power plant units. So that's what we have, um, but we had already mentioned Ohio ranks pretty high in potential. So if we think of Ohio as what is our potential, where do we have good resources, where should we look for the future? Ohio ranks sixth as a state in combined heat and power um, potential, and I put the term where up there that stands for waste energy recovery, which is, which is kind of a close cousin technology. 
Um, but the, the most recent U.S. Department of Energy report estimates a technical potential of 11,000 megawatts. Now, technical potential you could think of as like, you know, if you thought of CHP as a resource, as, as a resource in the ground that we have to mine out, we're not going to get all of that. Not all of it's economical um, or practical, but that gives you a sense of what we've got in the state. Well, how much is 11,000 megawatts? Um, <laughs> How many, how many power plant units is that? Um, you, get, you can see where this is going if your screen's refreshing as fast as mine. Um, it is equivalent to, um, I think roughly, I put 21 up here, you know, 21, 22, somewhere in the low 20s um, for, uh, if you equated it to a traditional power plant unit. So there is a, there is a lot of very energy efficient, you know, local resource, um, environmentally friendly power generation um, that, that the potential exists here in Ohio um, behind the meter at our manufacturers, um, universities, hospitals, other businesses. So right now it's like, hey, CHP is a, looks like a pretty good idea. It, it's intuitive. You know, I think everyone can look at waste, waste heat and have a good feeling um, about it that we can capture that. Um, there's a lot of benefits. It's a big deal. It, it's so good. It's so good, but what? You know, you have, you have to ask, or, or I ask, if it's so good, then why does this opportunity still exist? Um, and it turns out when you ask that question, you start to find a whole bunch of barriers to combined heat and power development, um, which, if, which you need to be aware of if, if we're actually going to see more projects happen. So one is that good candidates might have a, um, a simple payback of somewhere between five and eight years. And this is good candidates. Um, most businesses have, um, for their facilities management or their property management, um, for their non-core business areas, they will have a, a payback threshold that, that they articulate to their, their staff um, uh, that dictates whether an investment can be made. That payback threshold is usually two years or less. Um, some companies, it might get up to three years. Um, I can tell you in the manufacturing sector, it's very rare to see something above three years. So um, that's an immediate barrier. What that says is this isn't, this isn't going, CHP isn't going to be the sort of project where you have one person with their budget that makes the decision um, to implement it. They just don't have the permission or the authority to do that. That is not to say companies, well, actually, I'll get into this, you know, what's the but to the but, but um, there's a barrier uh, of simple payback, even for really the, the projects that happen, the good economical projects. Another barrier, CHP has a high capital cost. So again, it's not, it's usually not with any one, within any one person's budget. Um, it is something that many people within an organization are going to have a say on and have to figure out how is that, how is the project paid for, um, because there is a high capital cost. Another thing is CHP is complicated, and it affects key support equipment. It is, um, while it is a tried and true technology, it is engineering heavy. If you compare, say, a solar solar project where you just put panels out on the front lawn and then they sit there and work, compared to a combined heat and power project, that one of the first things you see is how much engineering needs to go into it. Um, there's some on, you know, an ongoing operations and maintenance. And if you're a manufacturer, or, you know, again, I'll broaden this to other customers, um, think of a hospital, just about every organization, at least anyone I've worked with, considers their core function, their core business or, or reason for being um, more important than just about anything else. So when you replace, say, a boiler with a combined heat and power unit, and that affects how hot water is delivered or electricity is delivered, um, there's risk there, and organizations are right to see risk there and, and take that seriously. So you start to see, you know, some pretty real barriers um, or things that need to be, have some attention paid to them with combined heat and power development. And I think this is an opinion. I think that's why we see that there's still so much potential in the state, why we haven't, why there's not those 20-some power plants worth of combined heat power out in the field today on its own. Um, and that's because there's some pretty steep barriers to considering and implementing combined heat power. But 
there's a you know there's a there's a response to that which is but some some companies have figured this out some companies have have looked at those barriers they've done the math they've looked at all the benefits and uh, they do that deal that and they get the project done and there have been more more of these projects happening recently so there's there's a slight uptick in the number of uh, businesses that are considering and installing CHP. So if you if you want to look at these, you know, one might try to distill out what are the, um, you know, what's the recipe? What's the secret recipe here for when a when you take a good candidate project and it goes through and actually gets implemented? Um, can we look at these companies that have had success so far and, and distill out? How did how did they make that happen? How did they get out over those barriers? Um, and so this is again subjective. This is you know for me talking to some of these companies and and knowing customers pretty well. Um, but I think what we've seen is there's a couple. You don't have to all have all these ingredients, but there's a couple key things. One is having an internal champion. Um, you've got to have someone inside the organization that um, has a pretty firm understanding of the opportunity and uh, wants to see it happen and it's going to help get all the other stakeholders inside the organization together and educate them and explain to them on on why it's in the best interest of the company um, if you don't have that because it is a is a heavy lift if someone's not willing to step up as an internal champion um, it could be difficult to get the organization or the business to make a decision to install CHP having an organizational energy reduction goal I think is a driver. Um, Ten years ago, most businesses or organizations did not have an energy reduction goal, um, so energy wasn't really proactively managed, and that is very different today. I think many businesses, um, probably about half of manufacturers, if not more now, have a specific energy reduction goal, and um, you know, up at the highest level, energy is expected to be managed and getting continuously better. Um, and reduced. So having an energy reduction goal provides, I think, the, the fire and the ammunition for an internal champion to look at CHP as a way to meet that energy reduction goal. Often there's an interest in reliability benefits. This won't be true of every business, but some businesses are in areas of the grid where maybe they have intermittent power and that creates a cost or affects their, their core operation. And so having Combined heat and power be a, a, a primary power generator, and uh, the grid connection end up serving as backup. So you essentially have two sources of power. Um, successful projects will often often pencil in the cost of the power outages to their organization. Um, and I, for manufacturers, that can be a big deal um, if if that's something the manufacturer experiences. Interest in sustainability benefits similar to the energy reduction goal. A lot of a lot of Bigger corporations especially have sustainability goals um, that are in response to shareholders and they want to show progress. Um, I, would, I would call this more like the icing on the cake if you have the cake and you have a need for sustainability benefits. Um, this, is a, this is an extra add-on. Um, interestingly, interest in long-term hedging of energy costs and we, we're seeing this also with other sorts of longer payback energy projects where before the, the payback threshold of the, the two or three years are under payback requirement. Um, now the script is being flipped a little bit where companies are looking at um, projects like CHP and saying, hey, if we can lock in, if we do this project, we, we created a lot more certainty about our, our energy situation, our, our energy costs within our control for a number of years. And so for companies that do have the ability to take a longer term outlook that know they'll be around in 10 years um, and are pretty certain they'll have a plant in the same place in 10 years, um, they may make that bet that that long term contract could become a benefit, start to be seen as a benefit and not a liability. Um, and then I think a, a key thing here is other energy infrastructure costs. Um, we see this a lot where CHP happens. Um, if you are, someone's already looking at a boiler replacement, um, maybe it's the plant is increasing capacity and, and uh, you have to upgrade a transformer that the company owns. 
um, or upgrade lines. Um, most of the cases where CHP is happening, it is happening at a time where there the company is faced with um, an alternative alternative infrastructure cost. Um, and that puts the finances of CHP on much better footing because you're comparing against an expense that, that is going to be incurred by the company no matter what. And so CHP then becomes an incremental, um, incremental cost. And you put the company and the stakeholders or the organization into looking at um, kind of a strategic play. What are the long-term benefits? Um, they're going to be spending significant money anyways. And so it becomes a strategic decision and often then CHP starts to look like a very good um, investment when you're looking at long-term strategy for a facility. So there's some good news there that, you know, um, companies are overcoming the barriers. So what are some resources that can help you along the way? Um, at the start, we really, we really strongly advise getting a, a screening analysis. Um, it was mentioned the Midwest CHP. TAP can help do this, um, and they're very friendly. We work with them a, quite a bit. Um, for manufacturers um, in the OMA, we also offer a free screening analysis. Um, and the, the objective is to create enough certainty about the, the opportunity that it justifies the time for the people in the plant to continue investigating. Um, so we'll look at what's the approximate payback, um, what would it come down to with the utility incentives. Um, we've got a fair amount of detail, but you know, it's a, we're going to look at this and, you know, within the next week or two and get you back a, a memo that, to share with management um, to give you support to um, pursue CHP or, or not. Um, it's an independent third-party screening, um, and I would recommend that. I, I know there's some developers on the phone, um, but look, the, when you have a third-party provide a number, it, it does lend trust to the savings and payback number. Um, and, and we think it's more likely to be acted on um, by management. So screening analysis from us or the Midwest CHP TAP, uh, we think are good ideas um, to, to let you know whether to take the next step, the right next step. And then, um, then there's a whole bunch of things, right? Um, it may be that for the system side, you, you need an investment grade study or system analysis. This might be bringing in an engineering firm to look at all the work that needs to be done. You might have to start looking at other considerations, right? Are you going to be hit by a standby rate? What does that mean? Um, how, how costly or not costly is the interconnection agreement? Um, Lyle, I was happy Lyle talked about that, and it seems like they've put some attention into trying to make that um, streamlined and easy. That might not be the case with other utilities. Investigating incentives. Um, so we heard from AAP and DPNL. First Energy and Duke are also going to have incentives for CHP projects. If you're not in an investor-owned utility territory, say you're on a municipal electric company or a rural electric co cooperative, um, they may also have something. Um, it's not as consistent, but, but my experience is many of those um, co-ops and munis are approachable about these sort of projects, and they could look at what the investor-owned utilities are doing for, for guidance. Um, and then, you know, sometimes there's things from the state, um, usually in the form of financing, or you might have low-cost financing through, through PACE. So there's a number of things that can help bump a project, um, bump a project's finances into a better direction. Then the other thing I would say is visit other projects, right? Um, get educated. And now that we have some newer projects, um, and, and we do have some of the older projects, um, there is the ability to get out into other facilities and, and see what was done, talk to the staff there about what their barriers and challenges were and how they, they got over them. And that's going to do a lot towards uh, informing a, you know, a customer from the customer perspective of, um, is this the right thing for your organization and is this the right time um, to look at it? So I think this was my last slide. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to take questions, but thank you everyone for your time. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, uh, as John mentioned, and um, you guys have ability to ask us questions in the chat box. So if you wanna go ahead and start typing some of those questions in there, we will get to those shortly. Um, but thanks again, John, and thanks to Michelle and Lyle. Um, as you heard, the policies and incentives discussed by our speakers were shaped through the energy efficiency cases at the Public Utilities Commission in Ohio. 
um, through partnerships with organizations like OMA, as well as the Midwest CHP Technical Assistance Partnership that you also heard about today, utility customers are able to quickly determine whether and what kind of CHP system would work to make their business more energy efficient. The type of collaboration between the state, utilities, and customers is what Ohio needs to allow this type of CHP development to thrive. So if you guys, again, if you have questions, feel free to type those into the box, and we've got a couple already. Um, one question was directed toward DPNL, so this is for you, Lyle. Um, is the eight cents per kilowatt for net generation, um, meaning just used on site, or is it just for kilowatt per hour uh, pushed back onto the grid? Yeah, the incentive is designed to be uh, just for what is used and generated on site. Um, we will we will not incent uh, anything that's put back on the grid in that sense. Um, I guess net metering and what is put back on the grid uh, would pertain to any micro turbine system uh, that are installed, but that would be at a different rate and that would be um, uh, involved on the interconnection side and not on the energy efficiency side. So I'm not sure what exactly that uh, net metering rate Okay, thanks, Lyle. Um, another question that came in from um, uh, a listener, um, what is the utility motivation to consider CHP, um, in your opinion? Um, that's for Lyle or uh, Michelle. Well, it's a, it's a very uh, cost-effective uh, measure uh, for someone to install as far as the benefits go and the avoided the avoided electricity costs. Um, it's, it's really huge. It's one of the most, uh, most cost-effective measures that can be installed when it comes to energy efficiency. Um, that's why, that's why we, we do it, and I believe that, that would be echoed by most of the uh, other utilities out there. Yeah, I would just second what Lyle said. Uh, it is very cost-effective from an energy efficiency standpoint. And recent legislation has allowed this type of technology to be considered under the energy efficiency programs uh, rather than altern alternative energy. So um, that's been really kind of the uh, impetus behind the shift in the way we're looking at CHP. Thank you. And we had a question earlier um, about um, the incentives, and John um, Syriac mentioned that uh, both Duke and First Energy also have uh, CHP incentives that they have in place. Um, if you have questions about those incentives, feel free to contact me um, at the information listed uh, right here. Um, and I'd be happy to answer um, those questions in more detail about what exactly that entails. Um, another question we got was, um, can these CHP systems provide ancillary services to utilities, um, for example, demand response, voltage uh, regulation, or frequency support? So I can, I think I can maybe take that one. Um, as far as demand response, with the CHP system, we are also measuring demand response. Um, I didn't mention that in my presentation. That's not what the incentive is based on, but we do measure um, kilowatt demand reduction. Um, as far as it, is there a program specifically designed to incentivize or provide a benefit for in response capabilities. I am not aware of one um, other than what is already existing through a Crest provider of some sort or a PJM demand response program. Yeah, this is this is John. I could add on that um, and also address that that one of the earlier questions about um, exporting our generation that goes onto the grid, not to the, the site. Um, most of the, the policy we have in the state right now and a, and a lot of the rules and clear guidance we have is, is mostly for um, electricity generated that, that uh, displaces customer electricity consumption. 
Um, and so if you're if you're you're within your plant's electricity consumption or pretty close to it, um, the rules are and the precedents are a lot more set. If it becomes an export situation, whether continuously or at certain times, like at grid peaks or for ancillary services, um, I don't think there's anything stopping the project from doing that. Um, but there's not, I don't think there's any direction or, or, or guidance for the utilities or the utility efficiency programs to incentivize that or, or help make it happen. Um, but there are, like, just from a market perspective, um, the wholesale electricity markets, um, that's something that could be evaluated on its own own benefits. Um, I would encourage whoever asked that question or if, if those on the phone see a, a, a good opportunity for that. Um, the PUCO right now has an initiative called Power Forward where um, they're trying to better understand what is the what's the future of the grid look like, and probably part of that is customers putting electricity onto the grid at some times. Um, and so, if you have a compelling project, you know I think the the thing is to connect with someone who who would know how this would work. Um, but yeah, I think not answering for Michelle or Lyle, but there's I don't think they have clear guidance or or in their programs to to help enable any sort of ancillary or demand response or exporting generation. So that would still be pretty new for the state for, for companies to do that with their CHP. And a follow-up question um, about the ancillary services. Would that, is it possible that could be an additional source of cash flow on a project? Yeah, this is John. I, I mean, I, would, I think the answer is yes, um, it can be. And it's a, I guess to me, it's a cost benefit thing. Um, if you're going to be providing ancillary services or, or doing anything where, where you're, you're putting electricity onto the grid, um, there, it's not necessarily the same, you know, dollar per kilowatt hour um, rate that you get when you're saving from when you consume. So you just have to pencil it out. And, and I think most projects, kind of intentionally cap their system size around what the facility can actually displace on site. Um, but that's not to say that someone might find a model where they can they can monetize the ancillary services. I just think it's you gotta do put the numbers there. Okay, and we had a question about uh, barriers um, for the utilities. Um, are the utilities considering other barriers um, to the CHP deployment, for example, standby rates? I can speak on DPNL's uh, behalf on this one. Um, currently, we do not have a standby rate um, that would deter CHP, but what we do have is a demand ratchet. So a customer uh, sets, uh, sets their demand in the, uh, the, the peak uh, points of the year, and if the CHP system were to trip off at on one of those peak days, they would set their peak demand um, for that day for the entire year if, if the CHP were to come offline. So um, essentially it's not a standby charge, but they could be hit with a demand ratchet if the CHP uh, system were to come offline. Thanks, Lyle. Um, another question we got, are there any new facilities that you guys are aware of that are planning to incorporate a CHP system up front? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but um, from what I've heard, uh, doing CHP at the, uh, the new construction phase, uh, especially for the right customer, makes a ton of sense. Yeah, this is Michelle. We do see CHP going in with new construction. Um, we had another question about cost effectiveness. Um, how do the utilities um, intend to assess cost effectiveness of the programs? Um, I can take this one. So I, I think the question was how do we determine cost effectiveness? Is that right? Yeah, that's correct, Michelle. 
Yeah, so we look at uh, a number of items, actually. We're going to calculate um, a utility cost test. Um, we're going to look at what the customer would have paid for that generation and, um, and potentially transmission costs over the life of the equipment. Um, we can do some calculations um, looking at present value is what we were typically going to look at. Um, yeah, so we do quite a bit of detailed analysis. And not only is it what the customer is paying, but it's also what is the benefit to the utility. So we're looking at our avoided costs with transmission and generation. Um, and we take into account the cost, the upfront capital costs that the customer incurs, as well as what is the cost that the utility is incurring for administrative purposes, also the incentive that we're paying out. So. Um, there's quite a bit that we can look at. We're normally looking at it from a more holistic perspective for um, all customers. How, how does it benefit the utility in addition to how does it benefit the customer? Yeah, and I can second that um, from what Michelle said. Uh, we do have a third-party evaluator look at, look at all of our programs for us. So currently, CHP falls under our custom program, so that will be evaluated on its own. Um, but like I said, we don't have any CHP projects to evaluate in our territory at this point. I'm sure we would do a separate evaluation once we have, have a project or two. Great. Well, we are bumping up against our time limit here. So thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, it looks like we've gotten to the end of our time together. So don't forget that today's webinar um, was being recorded. And so it will be available on the Ohio Environmental Council website and possibly o OMA, but I'm not sure about that. I'll double check. Um, and it will also be available through the Ohio CHP Connection website. Um, and all webinar participants will receive an email with the link as well. So if you have further questions for me, for Michelle, Lyle, or John, all of our contact information is here. And we really appreciate all of our speakers today, and we appreciate all of our attendees for being with us. Thanks so much.